Hey everybody, welcome back to the Thoughtful Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Matt. And your co-host, Chris. Today we have a pretty interesting episode. We're going to be talking about modern monetary theory, fiat currencies, fractional reserve lending, the history of money, stock markets, all that kind of stuff to give a bit of context for really why the system uh, needs to change. It's uh, quite old and outdated as a bit of a preview. But before we get into that today, I wanted to give a brief preview as well for next week's episode. We're going to be talking about public health and what it means. So that'll be a really cool discussion, giving a bit of context as well. Public health is a metric of societal health that is definitely not as looked at as it should be and referenced. But again, we'll have that coming in for the next episode. Uh, so coming in today, again, with today's discussion topic, I wanted to start this off by giving a bit of context for this discussion as mentioned. Money needs to be looked at in a technological perspective. Currency, money, the way it functions is a type of technology. It's not some kind of societal trend. It's not something that is like inherent to the way that to to the way that I guess a society functions as a whole. It's merely a piece of technology that we have evolved with to get to where we are today. But with like certain forms of technology, they have become outdated as time has gone on. And with how advanced we are in 2020, uh, in today's current paradigm compared to where we were even 10 years ago or even 100 years ago, we, we don't see ourselves still riding around in horse and buggies as the main mode of transportation. We very much have gone past that. And unfortunately, money and the way currency functions is very much in that boat as well. It is something that is stifling the advancement of the economy and the human species as a whole, and it is a very antiquated way to allocate resources and to really have as a main mechanism of how an economy should function. So, uh, with how many pitfalls that it has right now? There's just so many problems, like uh, not not accounted for in this whole thing. Man, yeah, it, it, it could be like oh, updated, gosh. but and, and changed, but man. It it has a it's ton just... of pitfalls, and uh, I'll I'll get into the historical context about that in a second here. But yeah, when when you think about money and how it functions in the modern society, Chris, what comes to your mind first? Well, it's definitely um, the firm in mind all the time is the most important thing. I mean, you need money to be able to function in this society, like a hundred percent. Getting money, there's like a lot of it out there, but it seems hard to get money, and uh, a lot of people. Like living in poverty, have much less money than I even make, and I'm you know low middle class over here. But yeah, there's when you start to look into it, there's a surprising amount of things that aren't accounted for when it comes to our financial system, like the interest that is gonna just keep on being created out of nowhere and changed willingly by the Fed, of course, and and banks themselves, but this debt that can't be repaid because it's just generated now that there isn't anything back. It's just, you know, what we're going to get into, like how it is, it's a fiat currency. And it's kind of, once you, once you look at it, it is kind of in your whole side when you have a lot of money, you can start to use that money itself to project, create and generate more. And, and you don't actually have to be a contributor or, or do anything for society anymore. You could just, it becomes numbers and a computer system that create more of its own numbers. And that's you living off of money now, not being a part of society. So there's a lot of issues in, in like parts of the, our financial system today that are being, you know, exploited or, or not accounted for. It's uh, definitely become a beast that we all have unfortunately had to deal with regardless of socioeconomic status, but to, kind of frame the discussion as well. I think talking briefly about the history of money and currency technologies is a good point to mention here. So we can go back thousands of years to some of the first civilizations 
You can look at things like the Sumerians, the Egyptians, you know, anywhere from 6,000 to 3,000 BC and beyond that. And this is where we saw some of the first inclinations of, of coins that were made of precious metals being used as a medium of transaction for, for different goods. This also kind of went in tandem with writing technologies where we were able to keep inventory of goods and trades and transactions, and, and that very much was, was a mode to organize early economies in that way. And it allowed exchanges to be done quite a bit more easily. But I guess one of the more relevant historical examples when we get into sort of the classical period, I'm talking about the Greeks and especially the Romans, they were the first examples of really, really large superpowers that expanded over large swaths of land that really saw these technologies come to what we might equivocate to sort of a modern type of experience. Uh, so especially during the, the Middle and Late Roman Empire, there became a lot of issues with their currencies. And a lot of emperors, especially, again, towards the latter part of the Roman Empire, had issues with currency inflation, currency devaluation, having issues with the amount of uh, actual precious metals that were being put into the coinage so that they were just devaluating as time had gone on, and also the amounts of crippling debt that would pile up over their, their citizens and the public sphere as well. So we were already echoing some of these things back 2,000 or so years ago, and we were very much still seeing those reverberations as we have uh, moved about today. And this is also one of the first examples where it became readily apparent that, that money is debt. That is the main way that money is generated, is through indebtment to some entity, some institution, or sometimes uh, individuals. And every, every so often as well, there had to be what was called a debt jubilee. This would be a decree from some emperor that would come about and see how much of a mess he had to clean up, whether he had just gotten into power or was trying to make his name better in the public eye. He would issue a decree to wipe all public debts clean. This was obviously followed by great festivities and a rise in popularity for whichever entity might have instituted this. But just because something like this had to occur showed how much of an impact it had on the public perception, how it was affecting people's lives, and how much it mattered to help get these people out of that situation. So the Roman Empire is very much a good example of what it looks like to kind of mirror how we are dealing with money in our modern day. So we could even fast forward a little bit here towards the age of exploration, kind of getting towards the 16th, 17th, 18th century, with Great Britain being one of the main dominant superpowers, along with France being in the mix, Spain. And when talking about England in particular, you had some of the first central banking structures uh, come about. You know, you had the Central Bank of England that was very much another arm of the monarchy to help consolidate power, especially here in the U.S., uh, which is where the show has taken place. Our founding fathers dealt with the separation uh, from the monarchy and dealing with the outcrying of that and the Revolutionary War and all that jazz. But they very much wanted to separate themselves from a lot of the institutions that they were beholden to under the crown. And one of those was the Central Bank of England. They knew that it was a way, again, for the crown to consolidate power and to have another lever that they could pull to really control how the society functioned. And that's why a lot of the founding fathers were against a centralized banking structure. But, of course, in early U.S. history, we had people like Alexander Hamilton, who were all for pushing through a central bank of America, and eventually, you know, 20, 30 years later, whenever the, the U.S. banking institutions really came about, that's when the, the shit really hit the fan, uh, for lack of a better word. But... As we had gone through the Industrial Revolution, coming in 60, 100 years later uh, within that time frame, 
uh, we really started to see the rise of the stock market as a financial institution as companies were able to get larger and larger, as technology really started to grow exponentially and allowed these, these companies to really piggyback off of that economic growth. We come into the early 20th century where we start to have institutions like the Federal Reserve being founded to help sort of regulate monetary policy when it's related to the US dollar. And we also saw, again, institutions like Wall Street here in the US become a major center point of financialization of the country. And of course, uh, after World War I had been fought and won, there was a period called the Roaring Twenties, which was a stock market boom. And it was very much a consumer credit era, like we have had mirrored in further eras that, that we're gonna talk about here shortly as well. And it was a time where the money was flowing, people were able to get goods and resources and whatnot, but it all came crashing down at the end of the 20s when the Wall Street speculation really uh, started to collapse and the stock market had essentially created a bubble economy, like again, we've, we've seen in recent times as well. So that obviously led to the tragedy of the Great Depression through which a lot of our great grandparents or grandparents or great 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 grandparents, whoever might be, uh, lived through here in the US and even in parts of Europe. So it's very much been exemplified throughout history that the boom and bust cycle is something that has been inherent to market capitalism as it has evolved throughout time. It's been something that, yes, was apparent back in time you know, talking 15th, 16th century, even back during the Roman times. But as we hit the more industrialized eras, it became much more pronounced. So that, again, was really highlighted by the Great Depression. But with a president like FDR, who really tried to rectify things through the Great New Deal, uh, creating public infrastructure projects coming off the tail end of World War II, we were able to kind of lift ourselves out of that uh, economic trap that we were in. Not necessarily for good reasons, but obviously public health was, was a big incentive here to help keep that going. But things pretty much leveled out for the next 20 to 30 years throughout the 50s, 60s. And once we get into the 70s, we really have the next biggest development here. And this will kind of spark the next leg of the conversation that me and Chris are going to get into. Mm -hmm which will come with the presidency of Richard Nixon. But before we talk about him, I do want to mention that previous to this presidency, the U.S. dollar had always been backed by gold. It was called the greenback for a reason. You can go to a bank, exchange it for equivalent value in, uh, in gold. And that was where the U.S. dollar itself as a currency derived a lot of its value. You know, we could throw out arbitrary numbers like, oh, there's 50 tons of gold in the U.S. Treasury or whatever. That amount of gold relevant to the gold market would determine the value of the currency itself. But as technology and the growing corporatization of, of the world and, and the socioeconomic system occurred, uh, in Richard Nixon's presidency, he eliminated the gold standard. and during his presidency, there was very much a recall for gold as people were encouraged to sell it back to the U.S. Treasury and uh, the Federal Reserve to get those gold stocks back. But the U.S. dollar shifted its value to not being related to gold. And what did it shift it to? It shifted towards essentially public perception, towards what we call a fiat currency. This, again, occurred during Nixon's presidency. So when you hear the term fiat currency, Chris, what comes to mind when uh, you think about something like that? If you know what uh, fiat means, which at the moment, actually, I can't remember exactly what language it was supposed to be rooted from. But it Italian. That's OK. See, I wasn't I wasn't going I for believe, Latin. I, I believe thinking, so. <laughs> right, right. But, but um. No, I think of money that actually isn't backed off of anything, like fake money. Um, yeah, fiat meaning basically like it is what it is. 
like you're gonna its value is what it says it is at that time with it with it not being backed by anything it makes it to where the government can actually just keep printing more the federal reserve too they can just keep printing more of this money based off of basically the fact that the government itself can keep doing it like it's it's the only thing that is backed by is the fact that there is the united states and we are using it as our our means of like yeah our commodity to switch things around but it's uh it's just it's it has value because we give it value that's about it yeah Weird. that's that's exactly what it is and we're also in the position where the u.s dollar is the world reserve currency when it comes to global banking institutions so that also gives the currency more credence over others and it is a way to determine international value but it also is important to mention that with the federal reserve being the main regulator when it comes to uh, monetary policy revolving around the u.s dollar the federal reserve is not actually a federal institution it is separate from the federal government it is it's not necessarily private, but it is a board-led institution of different financial, essentially, interests that control. There's, I, I believe, eight different districts that the Federal Reserve manages in the continental U.S. And each of those, yeah. yeah, each of those districts are held by a representative that all meet at the Federal Reserve to determine monetary policy, blah, 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 blah. And... This will get into the way that money is created today, which I think is an important thing to touch on, as when people think about making money, yes, you can think about, oh, I'm going to go get a job to make money so that I can buy stuff. But I, I think some people think of that as the way that money is created as opposed to where what is actually generating money what is the structural mechanism that creates money in the money supply not you as an individual going out and acquiring money as a resource but how does the system generate it and i think it's going to be very important to touch on that here so the the main mechanism so you you have both the Federal Reserve U.S. government bond transaction system, along with the fractional reserve banking system, is the main way that, that the dollars are created. And honestly, it's, it's pretty arbitrary. It's pretty stupid. But uh, I'm going to try and just do a brief rundown here. So essentially, the Federal Reserve is the producers of U.S. currency. And what the federal treasury does, the federal government, the U.S. treasury goes to, they exchange U.S. bonds for dollars. And the dollars and the bonds have equivocant values based off of the policies that the Federal Reserve uh, divvies out and also how much they evaluate the U.S. bonds for. And as the bonds get exchanged for the U.S. dollars, this goes back into the U.S. Treasury, which is, again, a federal institution, not a Federal Reserve institution. And it gets divvied out to the smaller banking institutions as it kind of trickles down the banking system in the United States. So it ultimately starts with the Federal Reserve. Then it goes to the U.S. Treasury. That dictates that to the larger banking institutions, your Wells Fargo's, your Bank of America's, uh, you know, the, the really big financializing interests that run the world. And it kind of trickles its way there down towards your uh, local banks, credit unions, all that kind of stuff as the main way that that money is distributed from the source. But when it also comes to the fractional reserve system, this is kind of the other side of the equation of how money is generated as well. So again, you have what the Federal Reserve does and the U.S. government and their relationship. But you also have what the financial institutions do with the primary funds that they're given from these institutions. So when it comes to the fractional reserve system, it's, it's pretty arbitrary in its mechanics. You have these institutions being given essentially loans, but they're like not really loans, but I guess they could be loans. I don't really know from uh, these larger entities. 
And they essentially take that as a sort of principle. And when you walk into the bank and you're looking to take out a loan, get a credit card, start a bank account, whatever it is, the money that is, is given to you as a consumer, as an individual, becomes the principal in a new transaction. And it's called fractional reserve because, you know, let, let's just throw out an arbitrary number. Let's say $10,000. You go into the bank, you take out a $10,000 loan. They give you the $10,000, but because they are also able to put interest on that transaction, once it gets put into their financial system, they're actually able then to go out and fractionally reserve that transaction up to nine times. So that $10,000 transaction is able to be loaned out and fractionalized up to $90,000 worth of additional monetary value. And as that is done, more and more loans can be created off of more and more transactions. And as that builds up over the course of various institutions, you have essentially where modern monetary theory functions in its wholeness and uh, how modern transactions are done kind of on a macro scale. So uh, again, Chris, when you think about how fractional reserve banking works and how sort of the, the modern mechanics of how money functions, what like what what does and what doesn't make sense to you because to me personally i i don't really think that there is really any meaning behind this mechanic like it it just doesn't really make sense for right. lack of a pun <laughs> well it what's what doesn't make sense to me again is like all we're talking about here is creating money by typing it in and like saying that it's there essentially i mean you know it's almost like how money could work in a video game like like you could just be a mod and go you know the a bank could just constantly be typing up uh the biggest number that they want and and it's it's just as equal as to having real money when they are able to use it in the system so like i mean, I mean like you said you you have a thousand dollars in the bank they can lend out nine okay that $9,000 literally just came out of nowhere. It's only allowed because they have that reserved $1,000. It's the minimum that they have to keep in the bank to be able to lend out the nine, right? Yeah, yeah. Boom, money out of nowhere. And then, you know, we haven't even mentioned, of course, like there's going to be interest on that $9,000 that gets loaned out, which is more money generated. But still, like, this could be the biggest uh, to happen. This could happen with the biggest number of transactions. What if we're talking about multi million dollar? loans or something like that where i mean again the money is created just because they have this this minimum in the bank and either coming from the fed or coming from people or, or companies whatever and then boom typed into a computer then and sit basically given like here's more here's more of the money that, that doesn't make that much sense because it's again it's like what's it what's it based off of i mean you could just do it because the the money is backed by the fact that it's it's the government i don't know yeah that's and and it's it's also a really good point too is i think it's like 98 percent of the money supply is just digital it's all just digital transactions held in federal reserve and u.s treasury databases and banking institutions and all this kind of stuff whereas two percent of the U.S. money supply is actually held in hard currency. So the, this kind of technology side of how money functions today has very much been a factor as well in modern monetary theory and sort of the, the weird financialization of how things function. At least during the gold standard, you could be like, okay, we have X amount of gold, so we need to have x amount of dollars to be able to back up that with gold like at least that had some weird bearing to reality whereas nowadays it's it's very much uh disconnected from that right and so what's what's stopping what's stopping us from just constantly creating more and more money i mean if it's literally like well, and th that's, the, like that's that. the exact thing. Money is just being created more and more every day.
Like that is right, exactly. one yeah, of the hearts right. of modern monetary theory is there's just a constant increase in the money supply. And, and you know, of course, like we keep on tossing around inflation, like the, we've seen it historically inflation being the reason for all these other economic downfalls. And, you know, like the boom and bust cycle and freaking eventually all these crazy values that just go up and up and up with these like money being fueled into the fire. It's going to freaking drop once, I don't know, the, someone starts pulling out their money or some event happens. And then the public, I, the public like feeling just goes down in general, like with the first stock market crash. I mean, yeah, it can be it, out of control. It, it really is. And with how, again, financialized things have become in the modern day, it's, it's hard to tell what the next financial collapse would look like. And it's... Uh, I mean, if, if anything, we're we're existing in almost a a low constant state of collapse with how everything is that that functions with your average person. But uh, just before we move on to to the next topic here, it is important important to mention that the concept of interest there is never going to be enough money in the money supply to pay back interest in full. Everybody went to the bank and paid off their loans all at once, and everybody's ready to get rid of all debt. There would still never be enough money in the money supply to pay off the interest that is put onto loans as transactions are done from that banking scale. It's another way that, that the money is just generated. It's it's, another way that banks make more generated profit. Yep, again, it is generated through debt. Money is debt. That is how it functions. And it's it's important to mention this because money is very much a way that affects public health and the well-being of individuals. It's important to know that because this is such an antiquated technology, it is literally affecting the health of the majority of people on the planet. And if you as an individual care about your fellow human being and you want to help improve the reality that most people on the planet go through, you, you need to have this be a point of focus, is if the monetary system is a part of the symptom of what is causing these issues, looking at how it functions and knowing that is very much a good tool to have in the toolbox if you want to see real systemic change. And it is, again, it, it's just... With the, you know, you had mentioned the boom and bust cycle, Chris. I think that's something important to touch on. Whenever a bust happens in market capitalism, it does nothing but push the poor and the middle class and the lower class down further, widens the gap between those things, it shrinks the middle class, pushes the upper classes higher up, and brings everybody else down. And yes, the upper class might lose you know three percent of their overall assets or something which is like toenail change to them but come two or three years later they're coming right back at it making even more money than they have before whereas your average u.s citizen for example we've seen our wages stagnate over the last 20 or 30 years or so we we haven't seen a very relevant increase in terms of of, of your average uh pay for your for like a blue collar worker for example while again the rich keep getting richer you know we have a handful of people on the global scale owning more than like the bottom 50 percent of the entire global population so like 3.5 billion people roughly you know a handful of people have more wealth than them that is just absurd and it does nothing but show the inequality that a system like this pushes and it's very weird to think as well that you have people that are so-called economists people who apparently go to school and study this stuff and who get real deep into the mechanisms of of money and the financialization the austrian schools the keynesian schools of economic thought and all this and they come at you with all this terminology to explain how the economy is supposed to work in this way or in that, when in reality, you just have to look at what is happening. People are in a state of decay. The world is in a state of decay. 
And with money being the main mechanism of how the economy functions, these people try and justify the system for what it is because they tend to be the ones who it benefits the most. And if, if you look at, again, how it affects your average person on an average scale, it has done nothing but keep us at the same pace, if not pushing us down as time goes on. And we are seeing trends like that continue where the rich will again keep getting richer. We're going to be staying the same. When these busts happen, that company is already too big to fail yep. and get bailed out, right? Like some of these companies can be responsible for the bus. These companies that are so big that you know may have like insured billions in money or loaned billions in money that you know are the ones who are majorly gambling you know, these these giant economic factors, and then when they fail, they can be the ones that bail out or or just uh, I don't know move away and become something else. And then like how you know you said the rich keep getting richer. It's literally like the most wealthy like person or entity to screw up the whole economy gets away with it. And then people look at you know, others look at these people as some kind of beacon of an example of what to be. You know, you want to be this financial god that has billions of dollars and has like four yachts and three jets parked in your front lawn and Africa is your backyard, like if if there's anything that, as we have gone on in more of the modern era, we have come to realize, especially people of, of our generation, Chris, that material goods don't bring you happiness. Yes, they can provide comfort and they can give you the level of security and safety that you need to exist and, and go about to pursue your passions. But having that be the pure means to how you live your life is absolutely toxic and to see how it affects the rest of the globe and the the absolute disparity that these people have in terms of their lifestyles and their resource consumption it's crazy to think about but to kind of backpedal a little bit when talking about the boom and bust cycle i think the 2008 financial crisis is a good example to kind of highlight mm-hmm. how the system really increases that disparity as time goes on. So for those who don't know, 2008, we had the financial, uh, they call it the subprime mortgage crisis. And this was done because a lot of financial institutions went about really finagling with the ratings agencies when it it came to creating uh, loans loans and, and credits and whatnot. So what they would do is they would create investment packages of, of different mortgage conglomerations and, and they would go out to other financial institutions and they would actually have these rating agencies which are supposed to, you know, oh, this package is AAA. It's a really safe investment that, you know, you're going to make 3% back on whatever. And these they were called subprime because they were actually being rated much higher than they were. You had people who were taking out loans to to get houses, to to get different things. But they were given these loans knowing that the interest rates would be high, the payments would be high, and that these that these people would eventually default. But that became definitely a financial bubble. Eventually, once so many loans had been given out and the bubble had increased to a size to where it was unmanageable, Everything, like with every boom and bust, it hit a certain catastrophe point. Everything popped. A lot of people defaulted on their mortgages, on their home payments, car payments, whatever it might have been. And, you know, the bank came knocking. That's why we saw a lot of people get kicked out of their houses, foreclosures, a spike to an ever-increasing rate. And it happens to be that me and Chris were both victims of this growing up you know my parents had their house closed on due to the financial crisis Uh, i believe yeah chris had the same thing happen to his parents so it it very much showed that it, it could really affect your average person you know if if we as as lower middle class middle class folks see that occur losing your house is still a really big deal 
Whereas if you're some multimillionaire who has not a care in the world, you already own 10 properties, you lose one, whatever, you're going to go stay in, in Hawaii for five months or whatever. You don't give a shit. So highlighting this is very important that the boom and bust cycle does nothing but, again, increase the disparity between the rich and the poor and to make that inequality gap greater. And if there's one thing we know about inequality, it does nothing but breed friction between classes and groups of people. And again, friction is caustic. Caustic nature creates very much a, not necessarily, uh, it creates a group antagonism, I guess is, is the way to, to, to say it. And eventually it is going to reach a point where the disparity becomes so great that there is going to be some kind of revolution that needs to occur. Not in some you know, guns marching to Washington or some crap like that, but more of a thought revolution and sort of a, a motive behind why me and Chris are doing the podcast as people begin to realize that a lot of this just doesn't make sense. You know, you have these people just using so much more resources and draining the planet to keep the same traditions that we've been locked into for hundreds of years. Whereas we have the technological capacity, scientific knowledge, and we need to bring the society and the socioeconomic system to match these kind of thought advancements. And again, that's uh, very much a, a main goal behind doing this podcast. But to, to kind of bring it back to a few of the last points here for this discussion, Chris. So I had talked to you about this before recording the podcast today. What comes to your immediate brain when you think about the term self-referent? What is a self-referent system and why is that relevant to money and the monetary system? Oh, meaning the only thing that it goes to, to look at is itself. Like, you know, the, the only factor that matters is it's its own entity what it's doing by its own so we say like with money it's uh the fact that the only thing fueling money is uh, uh more money or or it's it constantly like only looking back at its past trends to evolve it's only changing or, or deciding where it's going to go based off of what it's been doing already like nothing else really matters it's not it's not taking in everything else it's affecting yeah it's uh, another way to look at it is which yeah i think that's a very good very good way to quantify it a self reference system especially when talking about something like money has no relationship really to anything that truly matters in a real economical sense there's no inherent relationship to the natural world to public health to societal well-being to resource consumption, the externalities that we've talked about in some of the previous episodes of the podcast, there is no accounting for any of these very important factors when it comes to the monetary system. It is very much something that just looks at quantifiers like GDP, inflation rates, uh, how other countries are doing, is it a boom and bust cycle? What's what's kind of the, the trend looking like? How's the stock market doing? You know, what's the price of this or the price of that? And blah 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 blah. It's it's very the, the way it functions is looking at different metrics that it itself has created as a system, not looking at anything that actually exists on the earth as a system, the natural systems mm -hmm. that dictate our life and how the planet functions and its ecosystems, the resources that we have, and even us as a society and the interactions that we have between each other. It's very much something that is very much morphed into a beast of its own. It's something where money has become so, I guess financialized would be the term, is you can just make money off of having money. As Chris said earlier, People don't have to really do much once you hit a certain point to actually generate an income. You just 
go and you do day trading or you make investments and you you go do this that or the other thing and eventually you're you're just disconnected from participating in the actual economy as a whole so you you really become disconnected to a certain degree with how the average person feels especially with the more and more you know the more and more you get up the ladder you become more disconnected with again how how these uh, how your average joe really deals with these situations because you have no idea what it feels like to to work that 9 to 5 job whereas yeah you might have done it when you were younger if you happen to be one of the you know one out of 3 million success stories or whatever you know you you made your big million bucks and you climbed up the socioeconomic ladder just because of your pure will or whatever the hell it is that is definitely like winning the lottery and that is not where the majority of people are in, in that circumstance so just as kind of to, to to round out this discussion money is an old technology it its mechanisms have changed a little bit as technology has uh, kind of come into the picture with the fiat currency innovations how we've gone away from the gold standard modern monetary theory and how the u.s dollar really has morphed into kind of a beast of of its own compared to even previous currency technologies that have existed throughout history and as we've broken the malthusian trap and we've gone through the industrial revolution we have really seen that shift start to occur uh, the way money is generated is very arbitrary there's no real referent to the natural world or natural systems to actually generate value or to create any kind of positive system feedback to to show that it is a viable mechanism which i i guess but before we we really finish and round out this discussion chris a viable system mm -hmm. Do you see this as a viable system? Does it have those metrics to, to meet that quantifier? No, 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 not at all. I mean, just looking at how it's a, a self-referencing system, I mean, that alone isn't taking in enough factors to be a viable system. You know how you need uh, high amounts of recursion, yep. like, like layers of cycles feeding back into the system constantly. Ashby's like law. Looking, right. Oh, true. Absolutely. Some type of regulating uh, ability to make sure nothing gets out balanced. But if it's a just the fact that it's a self reference system by its own, you know, money just looking at what money's doing to say if yes, we're good or no, we're not, or whatever needs to be done. I mean, that's not taking in enough factors to be viable. Not at all. Yeah, it's it doesn't meet any of those quantifiers. And some of the regulatory you know entities in this system like the federal reserve only have as i mentioned in the previous episodes as well they only have so many levers that they can pull to really try and control the system but regardless of what occurs boon bust cycles still happen people still go broke public health deteriorates as an outcome and inequality does nothing but grow and it is very much an unfortunate reality that we're looking to change with discussions like this to really point out the absurd nature of how money functions. But we'll definitely be getting into more of the solution side of things as we round out the Foundations playlist. And that's something that me and Chris are really looking forward to, to help really prevent mm -hmm. or present these solutions to say, hey, this is a more viable system that does not use money as its main way of of orienting and the main mechanism of the economy and we even touched on that in the last episode with the new human rights movement showing a few aspects of what might entail sort of a new economic transition into the modern day and age so if if anybody's interested into diving a little bit deeper into money and how it works i very highly recommend watching the second zeitgeist film directed by peter joseph you can go you can find it online very much worth worth a watch but it 
definitely gives you a, a pretty detailed breakdown, similar to what we did here today, but with more interviews and more context compared to what we were able to do. And it really gives you an even larger picture on the monetary system functions and just really how arbitrary and, and stupid it is <laughs> to, to lay it all out on the table. So, yeah, uh, Chris, is there anything else you want to touch on here before we go ahead and head out? Well, there was the uh, the whole concept of, you remember how earlier we mentioned, like, the Jubilees and the, the debt erasing possibility that they had done in history? Oh, yeah, yeah, especially during the Roman Empire, yep. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, you know, and why that'll never be done nowadays, obviously. I mean, if you were to erase debt out of nowhere for everybody, I mean, uh, the, the, there would be widespread, like, like panic because a lot of uh, big institutions are going to all of a sudden lose their, their profit making engine. Yeah, I mean, long. with money being made out of debt, and that's the main way that a fiat currency is actually given value. You give out and forgive large sums of public debt, you very much start to generate a systemic collapse in all in all honesty, because there's nothing again holding that value to the currency. So I I do think that was a very good point to bring up. Also like really looking forward to when we can get into more of the discussions about like any one of these topics. You know, after the the foundation has been laid out like this. Oh yeah, so that, for sure. It's it's gonna be really cool once we start talking about those things. But again, uh, we still need to lay down the framework for for these discussions as we go forth. And once we hit that point, we will let you, the viewers, uh, know, and we will uh, start to kind of shift the direction of the podcast. And we're gonna. You know, we love having these discussions for sure. It's always a good time. But again, the, the podcast is named Thoughtful Solutions. So once we get into the solution side of things, it's going to be a, a pretty cool switch up. But yeah, I think that is going to uh, end it for today. So uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in, everybody. And we will catch you guys soon for the next episode.